Hi everyone. Good morning and welcome to this online worship service at San Francisco Mandarin Baptist Church. My name is Vince and I thank you for joining us today on this beautiful Sunday morning in March. It's great to virtually have all of you here, whether you are in person watching from the pews or watching online from home. Thank you for joining us. It is certainly a blessing to worship the Lord together and hear his word. Let's start with a prayer to open this time with him. Dear Heavenly Father, you've given us this chance to congregate together and worship you. Thank you for this time. Help us to come to you with open ears and open hearts. There's so much noise out there, Lord. Things going on in this world, wars and issues in faraway lands, struggles going on in this country in our state, in our city, and sometimes within our community and even with our circle of friends and family. Some things we can comprehend and most of things we may not. But Lord, we know you are in control and allow us to put our trust in you whatever the circumstances may be. In this time now, help us to put away all distractions and help us to concentrate on what you have to say through Pastor Brian. Please strengthen his message and allow us the capacity to understand, absorb, and put it in perspective through your lens, Lord. Please instruct and lead us now. In Christ's name, amen. Good morning. Good morning to all of you who are worshiping in our sanctuary this morning. And also greetings to all of you who are out there who are joining us through our YouTube live stream and our Zoom hub. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. So today, we will wrap up our series called Journey with Jesus, Part 2. And uh, starting next week, we will begin a new series called Encourage. So please do join us for that next week. So as a quick recap from last week, uh, Jesus healed the demon-possessed boy. And Jesus tells his disciples, if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, you will be able to move mountains. And today we will conclude Matthew chapter 17. But first, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray together. Lord God, we come before you this morning. And we thank you. We thank you for this privilege, this blessed opportunity that we can worship you to give our thanks to you to praise you father there are many things that are going around in our personal lives as well as things that are going around in this world and many things we may not understand But Father God, we just pray that at this time, help us to set those things aside and help us to dedicate this time to you. Help us to focus on your word, what you want to say to us. We pray that you will fill each one of us. And I pray that you will also fill me as I deliver this message. And Lord, we pray that 
we will hear your voice. We will seek your face. And may your word live in our hearts. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So now, the conclusion of Matthew chapter 17. We will read verse 24. Remember, Jesus and his disciples came down from the mountain and healed this boy who was demon-possessed. And this is what happened after that. Verse 24. When they came to Capernaum, those who collected the temple tax approached Peter and said, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? So Jesus and the disciples arrive back to Capernaum. And they are approached now by the tax collectors. And these are the tax collectors that would be given to the temple. And these tax collectors were to comply with the Old Testament laws. So this tax was collected in person only from Jewish males over the age of 20 and over. And, and this money was then used for the temple. Now, th there were those in Israel who felt that they should not be having to pay this tax. They felt that being able to worship God should be free. And while that would be great, we would all hope that to be the case, it wasn't realistic. See, I don't know if you realize this, the temple was a costly place to run and manage. There were two sacrifices each day at the temple, one in the morning and one in the evening. And each sacrifice involved one lamb. So they had to sacrifice two lambs, one in the morning and one in the evening. And along with the lambs, they also had to provide wood flour, oil, even the incense that was burned every day had to be bought and prepared. And all this were needed to run and sustain the temple. So this tax was collected annually, and the amount collected was equivalent to two days worth of pay. And again, that's the amount each man aged 20 and older needed to pay. So here the temple tax collectors, they're speaking to Peter. And again, Peter, we've been talking about, he is the unofficial spokesperson or the leader of the 12 disciples. And I want you to notice now how the tax collectors are asking the question. It's in the negative form. The negative form, the implication is that they should be paying the tax. They ask the question, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Again, the implication that Jesus is expected to pay it. And later, as we read this a bit more, we find out that Jesus was willing to pay the temple tax. 
Now, I want you to keep this in, in perspective. Most of us, if not all of us, we carry a wallet. Some women may carry a purse with them. And, and maybe most of us would carry a smartphone. Right? One of those things that we would at least bring with us when we leave our homes would be one of those three items. And with one of those items, either the wallet or purse or smartphone, this would allow us to pay for things. In other words, we would not leave the house without some form of money. Whether that was cash or credit card or digital. But Jesus did not carry any money with him. Did you realize that? He did not carry any money with him. And the reason, simply because he had none. He had no money. So the question is, how were they going to pay the temple tax to the tax collectors? And that's what Peter was about to find out. And how this fits in the big picture. The big picture that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. The big picture of God being in full control of the entire universe. And the big picture of having the faith the size of a mustard seed. And by the power of God, we can move mountains. You know, sometimes what we think we know it's actually very different than the big picture. When I was in high school, I loved going to the beach. I mean, for those of you who didn't know, I was born and raised in Southern California, more specifically, Orange County. All my friends, and, and most of them were Caucasians, uh, we wanted to have that golden tan, you know, that really nice golden tan, that Southern California, California boy tan. And I also wanted to have that too. I mean, I was very active throughout my entire childhood. And uh, I would surf and also do all sorts of water sports. I mean, that's what all the cool people did. And I wanted to be cool, too. I recall one summer, I was snorkeling out near Catalina Island. That's kind of off the coast of Southern California. And it's like a mini version of Hawaii. If you haven't been out there, it's, it's a beautiful place. The water there is crystal clear. And in the water, you can see fish and you can see some coral. It's just truly amazing. And I remember this one time, a whole bunch of us, a whole bunch of my friends, we went out and we had a wetsuit and, and the gear. And we went out there in November, kind of like late fall beginning of winter, that transition. But the weather was still comfortable. Southern California doesn't get too cold. So when we went and when we were told that because of the water was not in a conducive state to be in the water, needless to say, I was disappointed. I mean, I was disappointed that we couldn't even be in the water. 
We couldn't do any water sports, whether it was snorkeling, surfing, or whatever. So we ended up riding one of those glass bottom boats. Now, the glass bottom boat is not as immersive as snorkeling or being in the water. But that can actually be good. See, sometimes we are so immersed that we can't see the big picture. And after riding the glass bottom boat, I was able to afterwards to capture the bigger picture of the ocean and, and, and the water and everything that lied beneath the water. And I realized by being above the water, again, we were on this glass bottom boat, I was able to understand the bigger picture than if I had only been immersed in the water. And, and this is what Peter was about to learn. How this temple tax fits into the bigger picture. Let's look at verse 25 now to verse 27. So remember the tax collectors asked Peter if his teacher, meaning Jesus, would pay the tax. Yes, he said. When he went into the house, Jesus spoke to him first. What do you think, Simon, which is another name for Peter, from whom do earthly kings collect tariffs or taxes? From their sons or from strangers? From strangers, Peter said. Then the sons are free, Jesus told him. But so we won't offend them. Go to the sea, cast in a fish hook, and take the first fish that you catch. When you open its mouth, you will find a coin. Take it and give it to them for me and you. So after the tax collectors inquired whether Jesus paid the temple tax, Peter told them, yes, he does. And after going back to the house, Jesus asks Peter, does the king collect tax from his sons or from strangers, meaning from other people? And obviously, earthly kings would not collect tax from their sons because they are part of the same family. And in the same way, God, the ultimate king, he will not collect tax from his own son. So even though Jesus did not have to pay the tax, he was willing to. He was willing to pay the price for the temple. Why? Let's go to verse 27 again. He says, so we won't offend them. Now the word offend here actually means stumble. So Jesus is saying, I will pay the tax to the tax collectors so that I will not cause them to stumble. I will not cause them to sin. Now, let me explain this a bit more in detail. Remember the temple tax 
was, was given to the temple. And, and what is the temple? The temple is the center of the sacrificial system. That's what the temple was. And the taxes that were paid for this was for the sacrificial system. And this tax was for the priests. It was for the sacrificial elements, for the wood, the flour, the oil, the incense. All these things were needed for the sacrifices. And ultimately, the taxes were collected for this sacrificial system to pay for the price of the sins of the people. That was what the temple was about. It provided a way for the price for the sins of the people. But understand that all of this that we're talking about was merely symbolic. It is symbolic that points to the one thing, and that is the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God as the true sacrifice, as the only way, the only true way to pay for the price for the sins of the people. And Jesus came to sacrifice his right as the Son of God to pay the price for the sins of the people. He paid the price for the temple and to be the true Lamb, the Lamb of God for our sins. So that through his death, when we accept that he is the true lamb as the punishment for our sins, we can be forgiven. Jesus came for that very purpose, to pay for it all. And understand, Jesus was willing to sacrifice everything, including all his rights, his rights as the Son of God, that would hinder others to come to salvation. That's the big picture here. Don't miss this. That is the character of God. That is the character of the Son, and that should be the character of his children. This is what Jesus wanted to teach Peter about. That as children of God, that we are to sacrifice our personal rights for the salvation of others. And whatever our rights would be is not more important than the salvation of other people. Our rights at home, our rights at school, at work, in society, nothing is more important than the salvation of others. When Jesus prayed to the Father and said, Forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And when he sacrificed... His right as the Son of God. We too are to do the same. We are to sacrifice our rights for the salvation of other people. So again, this fits into the big picture that Peter had to learn, and that we also need to learn, that as we recognize that our God is the God who is in control 
over all things. And believing that even the faith the size of a mustard seed, mountains can be moved. We are also to conform to the character of Jesus, the Son. And that is we are to sacrifice our personal rights for the salvation of others. And now Jesus begins to give instructions. He says, this is what you need to do now. Let's go back to verse 27. He says, go to the sea. Okay, I, I want you to picture this as you are reading this. He says, go to the sea, and, and then what? Cast in a fish hook. Again, picture this as we read this. Okay, cast in a fish hook and take the first fish that you catch. When you open its mouth, you will find a coin. Take it and give it to them, meaning the tax collectors, for me and you. Now, I hope as you were reading this, you were not thinking, ah, oh, it's a parable. No, this is not a parable. Jesus not illustrating just a random story just to make a point. This is an instruction. This is a direct instruction. He is telling Peter, go. Go, and this is what I want you to do now. I want you to go to the sea, cast in a fish hook, and the first fish that you catch, you open its mouth, and there you will find the money to pay the tax collectors. I mean, th think, think about it. For, for this to happen as the way Jesus describes it, as, it, as the way Jesus instructs Peter. Can, can you just imagine everything that needs to come together for, for this to take place? I mean, doesn't that just tell us something about who Jesus is? I mean, the authority for, for all this to happen Jesus didn't just say, keep fishing, keep fishing, keep fishing until you find that one fish that has the coin in its mouth. No. He says, whatever fish you do catch, the first one, the first one that you will catch, open its mouth and you will find a coin that will pay for the tax for you. And for me, that's what Jesus is saying. I mean, I mean, for again, for this to happen as instructed by Jesus, this had to be done by the power of God. And we would know without a doubt who. Jesus is. And this is why even if we have a mustard seed faith to believe in this, even mountains can move. Nothing will be impossible because we are talking about who Jesus is. Understand this, if we respond by doing everything Jesus tells us, all the instructions given in the Bible, when we try to obey, when we try to follow 
Jesus and his on all his commands, this is when we will really believe. This is the evidence of how we would believe this is who Jesus is. Now, I sh I've shared with you in the past that my marriage with Misa was on the rocks. And again, this was early on in our marriage. We were going through some very, very difficult times. We were going, some, going through some difficult relationship issues that seemed impossible to be resolved. And it was almost to the point we decided to call it quits. But we both remembered, according to the Bible, marriage is a lifetime commitment. Jesus says, so they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. I know some of you may be going through a marriage problem right now. Just as, just as Misa and I have in the past. And maybe many of you have in the past as well. And it may seem impossible. And sometimes we just feel like giving up. But see, when you firmly trust Jesus, and you, and you trust and obey what he says. You will see mountains move. And you will see the mountains move in your marriage. And that is when you will witness the power of God. The power of God can only be witnessed when we trust and obey Jesus. Not the other way around. Understand this. It is only when we first trust and obey Jesus. That is when we will see the power of God working in our lives. We need to have this type of faith. A mustard seed faith. That is when we will witness God's power. Now we know that Peter was one of Jesus' closest friends. He was one of the 12 disciples. And he was one of the three pillars of the church, along with James and John. And though Peter had a lot to learn, as we can see here today, Jesus continued to, to mold him into exactly what he wanted Peter to be. See, Peter was not a perfect follower of Jesus. I mean, he, he was far from it. But in the end, Peter had the mustard seed faith to trust, to obey and to follow Jesus for the rest of his life. And those who are here this morning, maybe you are admitting you are just like Peter. You are far from being a perfect follower of Jesus. You have your ups and downs. But at the same time, you know what Jesus wants you to do. And you know what his word is and what the word tells you to do. 
But the problem is you do not trust him. Let me encourage you to remember who he is. Jesus is God. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. And he is in control over all things. And if you're having doubts this morning about this, I pray that you will join me in prayer and to renew your trust in him and to obey him. Because that is how God will show his power in your life. And if you have not received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, if you have not received Jesus in your life, I urge you to do that today. Jesus came for you. And he paid the price for your sins so you can be forgiven. And if you would like to make that decision today, and you would like to know the next steps or what the next steps could be, I invite you to either contact myself or any one of the leaders in our church, and we would be happy to talk to you. Please do that today. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you. We thank you for, the, for your word this morning. We thank you for the reminder that we need to trust you. We need to obey you. And that we need to follow you. Often we forget who Jesus is in our lives. We forget that he is in control over all things. He's in control over the entire universe. And Lord, it is sometimes just easier that we just take and we, we handle everything from our own perspective or we handle things with our own hands. But Father, help us to trust you. Help us to obey you. Give us the mustard seed faith to believe in you. And Lord, I know it's hard to be a perfect follower of Jesus. And even for myself, I may have my ups and downs. But Father, we pray that you will give us your strength you will give us your power and your grace so that we can do that. That we can follow Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And Father, if there's anyone here who does not believe in Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, Father, I pray that they will find salvation today. Salvation will come to them today. Lord, I pray that you will open their hearts, you will soften their hearts, and they will receive Jesus in their life. And Lord, at this time, we want to give you our tithes and offering. And again, we've been doing this either online or after the service. But Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. Help us to be faithful. And may this be used so that the gospel, your word will flourish in this city, in this nation, and in the world. Lord, we thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Thank you for joining us today at San Francisco Mandarin Baptist Church. We pray that this message will be a blessing to you and to your family. Let's close now with the benediction. Let's pray. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.